Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Hope everybody well is doing well this Monday morning. Uh, hopefully, everybody had a great weekend. If you're listening here on iTunes and Stitcher, once again, thank you for listening. If you're joining us here live on the Facebook Live broadcast, hey, good Monday morning, everybody. Uh, we had a great weekend. We had a couple investors in town for a fast track training. So big shout out to Steve Lindstrom and Laura Blanc and uh, Phil and Melanie Jacobs. Join us from Detroit. Steve's joining us from San Francisco and Laura from Wembley, Texas. So we had a really good time. I want to thank all of you guys for coming out. Um, today's topic, it deals with really what a lot, some people really struggle with. And it's it's more so the part-time investor that struggles with the balancing act, I like to say, that a lot of entrepreneurs deal with or budding entrepreneurs who are looking to either leave their job, leave their career to be a full-time uh, real estate investor. And I'm not really talking to people that work like an hourly job who can come and go. Their boss doesn't really care. Um, I'm talking about the people literally more so that have already made full-blown careers. They have a, a job. They've got a title at a company. Um, and specifically, their boss is probably not happy or does not want them doing something outside of their own job. They don't want them moonlighting. Um, when I'm talking about this is we have had quite a few people that actually come to our trainings and come gone to the workshops who, you know, like I said, they have a job, they have a title, they've gone went to school to be an engineer or something else like that. And they, their company looks down upon them for having and doing something on the side. Oftentimes they've got to get what's called a um, OBA form sign, an outside business agreement. You know, they obviously don't want them doing something that interferes with their full-time salary, with their full-time job, their full-time focus as a job, um, as an employee or W-2 or whatever it is. But, and I know a lot of people struggle with it because they're doing something now. Maybe they've been doing something they went to school for or got a college for or worked their way up and they've hit that ceiling or they've hit that wall where they're, um, this isn't really what I want to do. This, the, or they've come to the realization that the 40, 40, 40 plan isn't for them. Now, what do I mean by the, the 40, 40, 40 plan? Um, where they put in 40 hours a week for 40 years to retire on 40% of what they make. That's the 40, 40, 40 plan. And let's not, let's not, let's be realistic here. A lot of people we're taught when we go to school, work hard, study hard, get good grades, get a good degree, go get a good job. And the company will take care of it. And we all know that's not the truth these days. If you, we all know that is not the case in society these days. A lot of people are, where you know, you're being outsourced. You're being let go for younger employees. Your job's being outsourced across the country, or your job is totally no longer available because of technology and things increasing. Uh, or you work for the state government. <laughs> As our buddy Cody said here, or you work for or work for the state government. Yeah, I guess that's exactly. Yeah, that's a, a great example. They don't want you doing really something outside of there. And I, most people have to go get something signed by a boss so they don't get in trouble. Because if they get in trouble, they can lose their job. Right? Get written up, lose their job, have some bad things happen to them. Well, the beautiful thing about real estate most of the time, or investing, especially real estate investing, is that we can use that as a tool. If you do have to sign one of those forms, hey, I'm just buying and flipping properties. It's a way to help boost my 401k, to help me boost my retirement. And it's usually not directly related to the other job as an engineer or you're working for the state government or anything. It's usually not related for the most part. So most of the time, a lot of employers will sign off on it because it's something, hey, I do. It's a hobby I do on the weekend. I've always had, or I, my family's always had rental properties, or we've always done fix and flips, or it, it's a hobby with mine on the weekends. You know, if you can portray that, that's a great thing. If it, and that's the truth most of the time. What gets a little dicey is specifically in the note game when you're reaching out to asset managers, when you're reaching out to banks and hedge funds. It only, I mean, you have to basically create a company profile, right, everybody? And that's where our good friend, you know, Aaron Young at Lawful Associates, and I talk about helping set up structures and LLCs and S-Corps and things like that. You have to have that business mindset. If you remember what Aaron likes to say, I am not the company, the company is not me, right? Well, that doesn't always go over very well at jobs sometimes. A lot, I, we've had some students of ours who've got written up or face losing their job. Uh, and I'm not bashing jobs. I mean, there's, there's 
a means to an end. I mean, so, sometimes you, you've got to have the health insurance benefits through a bigger employer that a smaller one doesn't offer. Or the, the 401k cannot be is not a bad thing if they'll give you a percentage and help match it. Hey, that's the easiest and cheapest money when you – it doesn't matter what they match. If That's what I always say as a financial advisor. If you're working for a company of a 401k, we're type of matching, max out that ma that matching. That's 100% return on investment. You can't beat that for the most part. Okay? But when you have to start using your other money for things, that's the investment side. And I'm always a big proponent of like, well, why are you telling me what I can or cannot do with my investment money? With my money. If I want to go buy a house, great. If I want to go buy an investment property, great. What gets a little dicey is when you get to the marketing side. Now, one of the biggest places that we market and people market on a regular basis is obviously like LinkedIn. Good morning to, but it's watch there, Laura Blunk, Gene Chandler. Good to see you guys. Awesome. And LinkedIn obviously is a very professional network. It's not like marketing to Facebook or posting to Twitter or Instagram um, or Google Plus if you still do that. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is LinkedIn is a professional profile. If you have people that you work with, on LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is pretty good about notifying people that you've added a new job or added a new career. So you have to be careful, especially if you're uh, reaching out to asset managers on a regular basis. That's the first place that they're usually going to go look. Like an email from somebody, they get a phone call, a voice message. They're usually going to jump on LinkedIn and say, who is this guy? Like, I just did this today for a student. Like, somebody's griping about something or complaining about they didn't get a bid accepted. And I'm like, let me go see who this guy is. I don't I, you know. That's the I think I look at. Many asset managers look at it too. So you have, you always have the, the balancing act, okay? Well, I have my career, my engineer, my chemical engineer, whatever it is. Do I start a new profile, a whole new profile on LinkedIn and start from scratch there? Or do I just add a, you know, a, a title or a, res a LinkedIn resume thing on the bottom of what I'm doing? And I can't answer that question for you. I I, I, don't, I don't like creating a whole new LinkedIn profile because you got a new different email and you got to keep up with it. I think it's better just to go ahead and throw it up on your regular profile as either hobbies or projects or as another thing. Hey, I'm also the you know managing member of this LLC. Um, what you have to be careful about after you post to LinkedIn is your marketing side. Are you sending emails out to uh, to your database? Are you exporting your LinkedIn connections? And that's where it gets kind of dicey. Are you friends with a lot of people on Facebook that you work with? Okay. And it can work in your favor if you're working somewhere and, and other people are disgruntled or not making enough money. Um, we've had some people whose bosses is like, oh, I want to learn more about what you're doing. I want to invest with you. I get that. That's a, that's a good thing. But it's not always that case. Sometimes you have to worry about, uh, are you stepping on Big Brother's toes? Are they going to get upset and am I going to lose my job, which I have not built my real estate or note business up to where it needs to be. Is that making sense? So the biggest thing I can tell you guys and gals out there is when you do add LinkedIn connections, let's make sure, um, and you're going as you're adding asset managers, other real estate investors, as you export that list, what you do not want to do you do not want to do is go ahead and remove anybody from it that you don't want to see your emails. Go ahead and upload that that list into your Infusionsoft or your base, uh, um, so your Mailchimp or whatever your other email service provider is, and then go into your contacts on Mailchimp or Infusionsoft, and then unsubscribe those unwanted contacts manually. The reason for this is if you unsubscribe subscribe them manually inside of MailChimp or Infusionsoft, even if you re-import the list, which you're going to do probably on a monthly basis as you grow your connections on LinkedIn, things, as you re-upload that list, it won't add them again because you've unsubscribed them already from the list. So that's that's a good thing. That helps you filter because a lot of people are spending time each month going through and, and just deleting them off their list, their LinkedIn list before they upload them, and they're doing double the work. It becomes uh, very much a pain in the ass. It's manually. It's actually a deterrent for you using your LinkedIn contacts. Now, when it comes down to your projects or things like that, or you're talking to asset managers, or you're talking to banks, they're gonna look at your profile and you have to be honest. Hey, I'm an active investor in my part-time. I still work full-time, uh, you know, for such and such company, or I'm still an engineer, or I'm still a CEO or CFO, or I'm still in charge of this program for the state. 
you have to be, you know, obviously it's a it's a balancing act sometimes. You know, you've got to keep try to keep the two separated as best you can and maximize what happens. <laughs> this is a so you want to maximize your free time that you have available for it. But we all know with the ebbs and flows of life, there are times at jobs that you have to spend more focus there and can't focus on your real estate business or vice versa. You'd like to spend more time in your real estate business, but you don't have time. So you're stuck busy focusing on your job. And I understand some people absolutely hate their jobs. I get it. Some people really enjoy it. I am not telling you here. I'm not sitting here telling you, hey, go quit your J-O-B. Okay. What I'm telling you to do is you have to really focus on the hours that you have available. Good morning, War Blunt. Good to see you. You have to focus on the time that's available. If you all you've got is 10 hours a week because you work from nine to six or nine to seven every day at your job, I don't expect you to come home from seven, work from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. That's, you know, that's not a balanced life. If you've got friends, you, I mean, you've got family, you've got to eat, you got to get right sleep because the last thing you want to be working till four o'clock in the morning or something, you have to get up and go to work at nine and be unproductive and lose your job at that point. What you have to do is set out a plan of action that allows for you a transition period or transition plan if you want to ultimately be a full-time real estate investor or a full-time note investor to figure out, okay, what am I making at my job? How many deals do I need to do in a year to replace that annual salary or replace that monthly income on a residual basis? And the really easy thing to do is look at your numbers. And so, okay, so you want to make 120 grand a year. That's what you're making is a salary, okay? 120 grand a year. If you divide that by 12 months, obviously you're bringing about 10 grand a month, right? Well, if your average, let's just say your average uh, reperforming note deal is somewhere between four hundred and six hundred dollars a month on the on the cash flow, especially specifically the lower hanging fruit stuff, the stuff that's below one hundred thousand dollars in value. So let's say it's five hundred dollars a month is what you're going to get on a reperforming note. Well, you take that five hundred, divide that into your ten thousand a month. That's twenty deals that you've got to do to have closed by the end of the first year to have a ten month residual income coming in from modifications or from cash flow from your loan payments. Now, if you're using other people's money, all right, and you have to split that cash flow, then you probably need to double your numbers. So instead of doing 20 in your first year, you need to focus on getting to 40. Now, that seems like an awful big number immediately when you're right out the gates. You're like, oh my gosh, I got I to gotta close 40 deals to get this one. And I'm the first one that's going to tell you that you're not going to have 100% of your loans get reinstated or modified. It's not going to happen. You're only going to have about 50% of what you get done or what you buy. If you target on occupied assets where they you know, made payments, things like that, you're still only going to probably have about 50, 55, 60% of those reinstate on a good time, on a good scale. I would probably plan more on 40%. Well, what does that mean? That means you're going to buy notes that you hope that you're going to modify or reinstate, and the borrowers are going to have their heads shoved so far up their butt or so shoved so far deep in the sand like an ostrich, they're not going to respond to you. Now, that's not a big thing to fret and, and worry about because that's just a law of the business. It's just a natural act of people, all right? Those deals, all right, those deals are going to probably turn into foreclosures or REOs, okay, that you end up selling off and making bigger checks. Maybe you're making a five grand or 10 grand check on those, as you foreclose a tournament of REOs. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Gail. Um, uh, Gail uh, Laura asked a question. Does that 50% go for CFDs as well? Uh, yeah, um, we see that for the most part, especially if you're targeting CFDs that, that where the borrower has made payments in the last 6 to 12 months, which I believe you are. And now if you targeting CFDs where they haven't made a payment in the last 12 months, or it's a vacant property, it's not going to be a, a reperformance for the most part. It's going to be a, a property you take back or foreclose or do a cancellation of contract on, take it back, and then either sell it, you know, as an REO, on your finance, do whatever you want. Now, that's your, that exit strategy, if you take the property back, is completely up to you. Now, that's another thing. So let's look at that. So if you're buying, say you need 40 deals because you're using other people's money to get that 10 grand a month. If you get half of them, out of your 40 that turn into REOs, you should probably be making at least Five grand of those. So 20 of those deals turn into five grand. That's still not bad. That's still 100 grand. And then you have five grand. The other 20 um, are bringing in residual income to you of five grand a month. So some people look, oh, that's big chunks. I can pay some debt off. Maybe I can put st sock some money away. 
and live off that money in savings while I transition? You know, that question is up to you. The idea, though, that you have to have is you have to understand those numbers. Now, to get to 20 deals, you figure this, you really, could, if you doubled your numbers almost every quarter, you would basically you know, get there, if you think about this, okay? If you did if you did three notes in your first quarter, okay, and you doubled that and you did six, six more, that's nine, right? Three plus six is nine, and then you double that number to 12, that gets you to 21, okay? Three your first quarter, double that to six the second quarter, double that to 12 the third quarter, or you just do six and six the last two. That gets you to 21 roughly too as well. So um, our good, we had our good buddy Gene Chandler, I think his Gene is watching. Good morning, Gene, we're listening in. He talked about how he does one to three, you know, one to two to three notes per month, and that's a phenomenal rate. He's working full time, he's got a low cost living, enjoys it, him and his wife do a great job where they're at, allows plenty of time for him to do his hobbies that he enjoys doing, whether he's driving hot, you know, cars across Indiana or fixing up old cars or dealing with Gene. Gene's a big fan of Mallard ducks, you know, the wood ducks that you see a lot of stuff. He does a lot of painting. If I remember correctly, he's got a few unique patterns on a couple of those, but that's what I'm trying to get at. You have to determine where you want to be, what you want to do. And it's a long-term goal aspect of things. Now, I don't think most people want to go and work 40 years anymore for another company to retire. I think a lot of people understand that that dream has long sailed away. It's not really a viable aspect, especially if you look at what's going on in the world and the market. The entrepreneur bug has bit a lot of people because they realize they can make more money and work a whole lot less. I'll give you a great example. My uh, my trainer, Thomas Nee, used to work for 24-hour fitness as a trainer for them, working you know, 40 plus hours a week there. And he's only getting, most trainers are only getting 20 to 25% of what the people are paying for training. And Thomas, when he left there, he immediately got a pay raise and is working less. He's getting 100% of what he's charging, but he's only having to work 20 plus hours a week to get what he was making. And again, and that's the thing you have to realize is at some point, if you're doing this for a while and you're making money coming in, you, it, that, bug gets in your brain, gets implanted in your brain. Well, if I made this just working 10 hours a week, imagine what I could do if I worked 40 hours a week. You have to be very careful of that bug. I only say that as a voice of experience. When I left my uh, last corporate job in 2004, the freedom almost strangled me. I had a lot of freedom to wake up late and go home early and not do work on the weekends. And you have to really look at things and hold yourself responsible or the best thing you find is a coach or an accountability partner to give you the things to do to make yourself most productive. And that's often difficult for young entrepreneurs. They, you know, they have social engagements. They've got the, the bowling league or the other things like that that are going on. Or if they're, you're single, you're going out on dates or hoping to go out on dates. <laughs> okay. What I'm trying to get at is as Cedric Wilson understands here, you're not sold on that, uh, the sale of, you're not sold on the 40, 40, 40 dream. I get that. You have to realize that you have to put things in place. This is going to take time. We had a gentleman email me, uh, oh, I got to make money in the first 30 days. I'm like, then you better go start interviewing for a job then. He's like, well, why? It's like, listen, you're going to be stressed. If you're strapped financially, you're going to be stressed. You're going to overthink things. As you're reaching out to asset managers, you're going to sound desperate. Okay. You're going to sound you're not going to make wise decisions when you're financially strapped. Sometimes the best thing you have to do is put your dream on hold for a little bit to get your bases covered, to get your job, to get your assets in a, in a sling, out of a sling, I should say, and be a little more <sighs> be able to breathe versus constant pressure. Because uh, constant pressure is not good for you. I, I only say that I had to do that for a little while years ago. I had to literally take a step back from my dreams and take, you know, take a job for six months just to pay the bills, to get my assets underneath of me so that we can move forward. And this obviously goes back over a decade, but what I'm trying to get at is I've been in a lot of people's shoes. I was working for a company and I was still doing some of my, my fan, finance stuff on the side. And they're like, Oh, we don't like that. That's not a good thing. You should only be working here. Your sole focus should be here on this company. And I kind of laughed and chuckled. I was like, really? 
I look at your, you know, and I would think to myself, I'm seeing these employees that hate their job. They can drug it in every day. They're not happy. That's not what I want long term. And I, I made myself a promise years ago when I was leaving college that I would not work for a job that I hate. And I did for a little while, for six months, literally, till I got to where I was like, okay, I can breathe now. Let's reattack this. You know, sometimes you have to retreat from the battle so that you can continue fighting. You know, and your dreams are, are your dreams and hopes and what you and your family want to accomplish are well worth fighting for. Okay. But you also have to realize that it's a, you have to have a game plan. And it's important too, it's extremely important that your spouse and your family are supportive of it because that's that's even a, a larger uphill. You're going to have a hard enough uphill climb a lot of times if you're getting out of something, going to do something, to have your spouse or your family or your parents or like that pulling against you from going forward and almost an impossible climb. So what I always like to tell people is like, listen, talk with your family about what you want to accomplish. Talk about your dreams and what you want, how you're going to get there. And is your job going to get you there? And if it does, okay, great. You've got a great plan. But if you're not happy and you want to do something, be serious about it. Um, many spouses grow very tired of their other spouses, either men or women. It's on both sides, not just one or the other. Although men seem to be a little bit more aggressive uh, uh, in moving things, and women love having kind of a nest, feel for things, safety of the nest, especially when you have kids. Nothing wrong with that. It's a motherly instinct of having things shaken up and having things, what's the word I'm looking for here, go sideways. You know, as long as the bills are getting paid, as long as food's on the table, it's one of the most important things you have to do. So if you've got family, you have to really plan this out. You really got to work smart. You've got to plan your weeks. You've got to make sure if you've got 10 hours, only really roughly about 10 hours to focus on this, make sure you at least maximize, you know, five to 10 of those. If um, I'll give you a great example. We've got an investor, Ron, who works full time, enjoys his job, makes good money like that. He's told me before. He goes, Scott, I'm probably not going to go full time. I'm like, that's completely great. There's nothing wrong with that. He does a lot of his touches and his connections are going out and connecting with people at the local RIA clubs. That's where his itch is every week because he travels quite a bit. So if he's home for the real estate club, he makes damn sure he gets out and networks with people for two to three hours. That's how he stays connected. He also listens a lot. He also watches a lot of webinars. He also goes to, when he, he takes some time off from his job to travel to conferences to stay connected. And that's the things that are good. It keeps you plugged in while you build that dream, while you build that arc, I guess you could stay, say, from the ground up to help you carry off later on. Maybe you want to do this more in your retirement days. Maybe you've got retirement around the corner. Well, that's great. A, a large percentage of our audience is near retirement age. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with building a, a second career if that's what you want to do. Just be careful on how you approach it. You probably don't want to go into your job. Oh, I'm going to be a note investor. That's not going to be a good thing. Not only is it going to piss off your, your boss, but it's also going to make, uh, you're going to lose a little face with your employees because they're like, what do you know? And you have to take it kind of the, the slow and steady facet of what I, you know, we teach. You're not going to get rich overnight. You're going to get rich over time. You just have to build it one deal, one asset at a time and take it. And if you make offers and your offers aren't accepted or you're outbid, don't get frustrated. Learn, teaches a learning experience. Nobody bets a thousand in this line of work. I mean, we still see probably only roughly a 30 to 40% acceptance ratio on our bid. So if we're doing 30, 40%, you have to expect you're going to probably see a 10% ratio and keep that in mind. So if you've got to close on 20 deals, if you're going to use your own money or 40 deals, if you're using other people's money, you have to take that 10% acceptance ratio into consideration. That means if you need to close 20 deals, that means you need to be making 200 offers. I know that can be very scary when you're like, oh, crap, 200 offers. That's over a year. That's roughly uh, 15, 16 a month. Okay. That's five a week. That's very feasible if you've got the time to, you know, to focus on it, to work into it and get it done. Now, for those that are listening or watching on Facebook Live, first of all, thank you. If you guys have any questions or comments, Love to hear from it. Love to try to help answer any questions we, that we have for you. Um, one of the things that, too, we, we get some people that have weird working schedule. You know, they work, um, you know, later shifts, you know, or they work a, a night shift. Best thing I can tell you is to focus on the day. Carve out a couple hours a day where you can do some of your marketing. 
You can reach out to asset managers on LinkedIn. That's one thing that you can do at any hours of the day or night, okay? Now, a lot of people are like, well, Scott, um, you know, I don't have a family. I can work a lot of hours. Okay, great. Uh, as our buddy Gary Vaynerchuk likes to say, everybody has from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. for the most part, unless you're working a night shift. This is not telling you to work every day, 7 to Maybe carve out three hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, or the nights that aren't crazy uh, with scheduling, especially if you've got kids or family. And it, what's very important, make sure you, you share with your spouse. Make sure you get your spouse involved. And it could be little things. It could be little things. Like if you're going to go to a conference, hey, babe, I'd like to go to a conference. We're going to stay at this hotel. I want you to go to the spa during the day, and then we'll go to dinner at night with some friends or families and stuff like that. That's a great way to do things. With our mastermind group, people bring their spouses, and their spouses hang out in the hotel, either going to the spa or going sightseeing or going doing some fun things. And when we encourage the spouses to come hang out at night or even come hang out in the room for a chunk of the time. You know, if we're near Orlando and people want to go to Disneyland, go to Disneyland. We And, you know, we've done our masterminds in the past. We broke early. You know, we end of the day early so that people go have fun with their family. And we always try to do something to, you know, bring the family together, whether it's a dolphin cruise at Cape Coral, or going to a ball game or going to Estrus Follies here in Austin or going to a dinner together. The idea is you don't want to fight your spouse. You want to try to embrace and have your spouse embrace it. And they're going to have fears. Well, what happens with this? Well, what happens with this? You just got to have the answers. Say, hey, honey, this is what's going to happen with that. We're going to work through this and we're going to have a goal and we're going to set specific things that we want to accomplish along the way. And that's always the easiest thing to do. Now, one thing, too, is if you have family members helping you out in this business, hold them accountable. If they're not doing the things that they need to be doing, call them out on it. You are not helping them in any form or fashion. They're supposed to be partners in this business by letting them escape, let them go do what they need to do. And if they're not going to show up to things, they're not going to make offers, they're not going to help you market, then you need to call them out on what it is. And it's not always the easiest thing. Sometimes I think people that work together that aren't married or aren't don't share blood sometimes are easier because you can call, hey, bud, come on, man, help me out with that. So questions, comments, concerns from everybody out there. We are literally... Wow, we are just under two weeks away from Note Camp 5.0. We're so excited about that. We're roughly uh, 11 days away, uh, 10 days away, actually, from that. Tuesday night, this week, I'll be speaking at the Quest IRA Trillion Dollar Mixer. That's actually tomorrow night. We're pretty stoked about that. Uh, we're actually going to be live streaming that. Actually, Quest has asked me, asked me, Rebecca at Quest has asked me if I would live stream it um, because they have another event going on in Houston, so they, their Zoom isn't going to be it be tied up, so we're going to use ours to do it, okay? Woo, Eric Hyde says, no, Camp 5.0. Now, one of the great things, I, I'm going to bring Eric Camp, Eric Hyde, sorry. Um, there you go, buddy. Uh, one of the things you got to do is just be careful. You don't want to get in job. Uh, in some jobs, uh, Eric's a police officer, so you can't prom promote pictures of you in your uniform uh, against for something else. Unless you got to do with, he's a cop. That's it. You can't be, oh, I have a uniform, and I'm talking about note investing. Yeah, that's not, not, not a good thing. So just make sure that I'll give you an example, like firefighters, EMS, uh, police officers have some, you know, the 24 on, 24 off. So you have a lot of downtime. Our buddy Neil Clawson, okay, uh, same thing. He's he's on for 12 hours, off for 24, something like that. Oh, as Eric says, I got written up for that. Yeah, sorry about that, bud. That's one of the things you want to do is if your job does allow outside business stuff, OBAs, is to make sure and identify what you can and cannot do. But you don't want to get in trouble. You want to keep calm waters at the office. Um, so be careful about that. <clears throat> Never want to, <clears throat> especially in today's climate, when you've got to create a lot of a lot of go uh, jobs, um, often don't want you using social media, don't want you posting things, specifically politically or, or uh, religiously, because those are the hot button items that you'll get all these crazies running off the, uh, going just crazy. So anyway, guys, we're uh, 11 days out from Note Camp 5.0. We're excited about that. Um, lots of great stuff coming. And uh, we look forward to seeing so many people get involved with that and join that for our three and a half days with over 30 speakers. We'll be, you'll be seeing a lot of marketing over that the next couple of weeks as we get to rock and roll that, to get things rock and rolling. So other than that, guys, hey, Go out, be safe, go make something happen. And if you are balancing or dealing with having a full-time job while you're trying to do this, feel free to drop us an email at scott at weclosenotes.com. Feel free to drop me an email. I'll be glad to get on the phone, give you some ideas, some pointers, stuff like that, or put you in touch with somebody who's doing the same thing. You know, 
Um, I will tell you this. One of the things that I'm not a big fan of is I've had people come to me and say, hey, Scott, let's open up a coaching floor. Let's have you. we got a staff of people that we pay hourly that can coach your students, okay? And I'm like, that's you can't have an, an employee cannot teach an entrepreneur how to be successful, okay? I'm a big believer. You can't have an hourly employee teach an entrepreneur how to be successful because they have not been out there. They don't have their wavos on the line. They don't have, they're not out there taking the risks that entrepreneurs are doing. Clifton, glad that we could help you out with that. So we do a lot of things here with our, our office, our staff, to really help try to drive things home for you. So, yeah, we could go a lot bigger. It doesn't meet with what I'm trying to do long term. Uh, I think it, watered down, it waters down the message and that you don't have us watering down the message. You want us to keep giving you the real information and keep focusing on things and where the market's at. And we'll keep striving to do that. As, as long as you keep turning, uh, tuning in, everybody. So go out, make something happen today. And guys and gals, be safe, have fun, and uh, we'll see you all at the top, everybody.